Thank you, Dane, for that lesson, and thank you, children, for your great enthusiasm. Um, there is so much for us to celebrate the diversity of gifts that abound in this congregation. We're all grateful for the wonderful gift of the music ministry here in this congregation. And Dane made reference to it a little bit about this plexiglass enclosure that you see behind me today, um, encompassing our organ. Our, our choir members have been very compassionate and understanding um, and keeping their mask on throughout this COVID pandemic that we have experienced. Um, but as we continue to have persons who are vaccinated and persons who feel more comfortable not wearing their mask, the choir members are no longer going to be wearing their mask. But in order to still be compassionate and protective, um, it, we have placed this temporary plexiglass enclosure around the organ so that as the choir members are singing, they are not projecting all of that air towards Lewis's face. And so it is a protection for Lewis out of compassion um, for, for him and his safety um, as the choir members are unmasked. So um, I hope that y'all understand this and that y'all are grateful for the quick response of our trustees, um, our business administrator, Robbie Douglas, who helped to make this happen, and for our choir members um, for their compassion and understanding. We're grateful for all the gifts that are offered, and if any of you have been holding back from singing in the choir because you didn't want to sing with a mask on, now's your time to stand up and volunteer and join this wonderful music ministry as we give our offerings of tithes and gifts to the Lord in glory and in praise for the blessings we have received.
You may be seated. Our scripture lesson today, as Dane told the children, does come from the book of Revelation, the last book in the Holy Scriptures. I don't often preach from the book of Revelation, and there is no way that I can go into all that this book means and into the detail, but I do want to lift up this very special vision for us that is lifted up for us from the revelation that John received on the island of Patmos. Beginning with the ninth verse, let us hear these words. After this, I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, who are these people wearing white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he said to me, These people have come out of great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they be are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them because the lamb is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. How many of y'all have ever visited Disney World? How about Disneyland? Oh, fun. I remember the going to Disney World with my mom, my two sisters, and my 80-something-year-old grandmother one year. We took my grandmother to Disney World, and she was overwhelmed with all of the sights and the sounds, and some of it was quite scary to her, um, the characters that were dressed up. And, but we took her on this one event there that just melted her heart, and she couldn't stop talking about it. It was a little boat ride. Tony White already knows what I'm talking about. She's nodding her head. A little boat ride called It's a Small World. The little boat floated along, and there were these animated, cartoonish-looking characters from all over the world, all the different countries of the world, singing and dancing in costume. And at the end of the stepped out of the boat together, my grandmother kept singing, It's a small world after all, it's a small world after all. She couldn't get the song out of her head. It just stuck there. And after a while, it was stuck in all of our heads. <laughs> and congratulations, everybody. It's going to be stuck in your head for the rest of the day now. It's a small, small world. We do live in a world that is in many ways very small. I was meeting with several persons in my office before the worship service today who want to join in membership in this congregation. And as we talked, 
someone made the comment, it really is a small world, for we know so many of the same people even though we come from different directions and being connected to one another. We don't need Disney's catchy little song to remind us of how small this world is that we live in. We know a lot about the world these days. We know a lot about the world because of the internet and because of all of our technology. We know where Paris is, but how many of y'all know a Parisian and what Parisians feel today and what they're dealing with in their country, with their government, and what's going on there? We know where Moscow is, but how many of us know a Russian and know what they really feel about what is happening in their government and their political system. We know where Uganda is, but how many of us know anything about Uganda? Do we know the capital of Uganda? Do we know anyone who has lived in Uganda and what the people deal with day in and day out? We know the names of the 50 states in the United States of America. But do we really even know our neighbors who live across the street from us? Do we know their name? Do we know where they work? Do we know their life story? It's a small world and it's getting smaller. But that doesn't actually mean that we know one another any better. Just because we know the names of places and streets and towns doesn't mean we know the people or that we even see the people in other nations, let alone in our own neighborhoods. And yet, there is a faith surrounding us as followers of Jesus Christ to remind us that Jesus had a whole world inclusive view of the world. It's something that doesn't come naturally to most of us. We are usually afraid and fearful of people who are different from us, cautious when we meet people who look different or sound different. But there was an Episcopal chaplain at the University of Chicago who once said these words, he said that Jesus' own ministry was judged by his universal mindfulness. It was a scandal of Jesus' inclusiveness that led to Jesus' arrest, that led to Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus' world mindfulness. Jesus would not take sides in any struggle. He saw every person and valued every person for who they were. As we lift up this text from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, said very that in the vision that God gave to John of the last days, what he saw was this. John said, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, were standing before the throne of the Lamb, the Lamb Christ Jesus. This massive multitude of followers of Jesus Christ was remarkably diverse. Every tongue and every tribe, every group of people were represented there. And yet, in our world today, we seem to cling so much to people who are more like us and drift further and further apart from people that we perceive as different from us. We focus on the differences instead of the things that we have in common. Dr. James Kennedy, who was senior minister of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida, once said that he went to a recent national convention of sociologists 
And the sociologist, he said, came to an interesting conclusion about life. They said that most problems, the troubles and the anxieties, the turmoil that plagues society today are due to what? What do you think? They said most of those problems, the turmoil that plagues our society, the problems, the divisions that we have, the anxieties that we deal with, are due to our lack of communion. That's very interesting to me. They're not Christians necessarily, they're sociologists. I would have thought they would have said it was our lack of communication. We fuss so much about communication, how we don't communicate with one another. And yet the reality is we live in a world of mass communication. We have more tools to communicate with one another than ever before. It's not a lack of the ability to communicate that separates us and causes our division. It's our lack of communion with one another. Communication is the transfer of ideas and facts, but communion is something much deeper. It's a mutual sharing of values and emotions, feelings about our deepest purposes in life. And that's what we have too little of in our society. Really seeing one another, developing relationships with one another in our schools, in our communities, in our governments, in our churches, and sadly, even in our own families. So today, we celebrate World Communion Sunday a special day that was convened many years ago as a way to try to bring together the divided Christian community for us to come together in greater unity about the one table of Christ. It's an attempt to get the Christian community to focus in on what unites us rather than what divides us. So all around the world today, symbolically, we are called to sit at one table together to be reminded that we are the one family of God. No matter what the marquee on the outside of our church says, whether it says United Methodist or Southern Baptist, or whether it says Episcopalian or Lutheran, or whether it says Church of God of Jesus Christ, We are all one family, all one family together. It is that wholeness of Jesus Christ that calls us to his table today. Today's communion table opened on the other side of the international date line, on the Tongo Islands, the Fiji Islands, and New Zealand and Australia. Christians in those distant places joined their hands together. They cupped them together to receive this gift of life and nourishment that they could not earn on their own, but that Christ freely gives to all of us. And they dipped their bread in the wine or the juice, and they shared what we will share today in the remembrance of what Christ has done for us, calling us all to be siblings with one another who live together in harmony with one another. And this communion table will not close when we end our service today. It will go on to the other side of the international date line. And once this 24-hour revolution of sharing in the common meal together, this common humanity of remembrance, we will be called to live out what it means to truly see one another, to see people who are like us and to see people who are different from us on the outside, but to see that commonality of the image of God in each one of us. And so as we gather together for this meal today, 
I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you as you come forward to receive the elements, to cup your hands, to not grab and take the bread, but to receive the bread as a visual reminder to ourselves that we receive God's grace that is freely given to all of us. We don't do anything to earn God's grace. It is given to all of us. And when we recognize that, let us let go of judging others, realizing that we all stand in need of God's grace. As we receive this bread and either dip it into the common cup or receive one of the small cups of juice to drink, I want to ask you to hold mind in your heart the great company of humanity, visualizing us all together at this table, as in John's vision, people from all nations and languages gathered together. I ask you to think tenderly about who you need to welcome into your life and to think about families and people who this day are welcoming into their life, a precious new baby. You know, I can't help but think about baby Joe all the time, right? He turned one yesterday. We celebrate his beautiful life. And as I looked at my sweet grandbaby, I realized that every child wants tender, loving care. Every child deserves tender, loving care, no matter what the color of their skin, no matter the language of their parents, no matter their standing in society, whether they are rich or poor, no matter whether they live in a hut or a mansion. Every tender child belongs to God. I want us to remember during this communion hour those children, those children who are hurting this day and who need in love, need of love and tenderness. And I want us to remember during this communion hour people who are in prison. Some of those who are in actual physical prisons who are in need of compassion, who are in need of healing, who are in need of hope, who are in need of a friend. But I also want us to think of those who are in other types of prisons, the prison of poverty that is binding on so many persons in our world today, the prison of ignorance, the prison of fear, those prisons trap so many people in our world today. I want us to think about those persons and how we can reach out to be the heart and the hands of Christ, extending the hand of friendship, compassion, justice, mercy, and forgiveness to them. Hold in your thoughts and your prayers today those who fear to leave their homes those who view people who are different from them with suspicion. Hold them in your hearts. In this spiritual moment, as we receive this bread of nourishment and this cup of blessing, let us remember persons of other religious faiths so that those days of demonizing others might end. And in these moments, let us remember the aged among us, those who are living alone, those who feel that they have been forgotten by society. Let us remember all that they have given to make us who we are, all that they have sacrificed in their lives to make our nation what it is, to make our world what it is. And as we come to this communion table, let us think of those who this very day are dealing with diseases and illnesses and who are facing their own death. Those who may die this day because they have no food to eat. While we feed persons 
Monday through Friday through our wonderful ministry of the soup cellar. There are persons on other continents who don't have a soup cellar to go to. I remember visiting and doing mission work many years ago in Honduras and talking with a dear man who told me that what surprised him most when he visited the United States was the size of our garbage cans. We throw so much food away. Let us remember those who are hungry around the world. And let us pray compassionately for the leaders of this world, for our president and our government, but also for the other governmental leaders. Let us lift them up that they might hear God's wisdom and have hearts of compassion and justice and mercy. Let us pray for God's guidance upon them all. And let us think about all of the persons in this congregation who are not among us today for many reasons. And let that thinking and that prayer motivate us to reach out and extend love, a listening ear, and an invitation to be with them, to hear their stories, and to know them better. This day the world all to the communion table. Some will ignore it. Some will revile against it and call it foolishness and not understand it. But my friends, it is a sign of God's love for this world. And we are called to be a part of it. We are not in a corner isolated by ourselves. We are in the middle of life a life that calls us to reach out with this gift of life to others. We share this world with billions of people, and it is a small, small world if we take the time to understand that we are not the center of the universe, but God is, and God's love is all-encompassing. It is a love that runs deep. It is a love that runs strong. One man of God once shared how he understood this voice of God, this love of God for all humanity. And that man said these words. He said, this is how I perceive God's love. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of a former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. And in more of this dream, he said, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That is God's glorious vision. The vision that John had of all of us being free of all those things that separate us. Free to love and live together. It's the vision that we are called to keep alive as we come to the table today. So I invite you to take the hand of Christ when you come to the table today and allow Christ to enable us to bring all to one table in this place at this time. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.